worship and begin to begin to say something sweet to your God. Begin to say something to your God. If not because of God, where would you be? Where would I be? Where would you be? Where would I be? It's amazing. It's awesome. And we worship his holy name this morning. In your own words, just say something amazing to God. Just say something beautiful unto his holy name. Yahweh, 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 I worship you from the dead of my heart, Jesus, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh. Come on, say that word. Say it to Jesus in heaven this morning. Yahweh. 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 We worship you, Lord. Yahweh. Yahweh. seconds to speak to him speak to him in your heavenly language if you speak in tongues if not just begin to worship him it's okay just tell him Hallelujah. 
Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You are so beautiful. So beautiful. Savior. Emmanuel. Father, you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. Who is like you, Lord? There is no one who is like you, Lord. There is no one, Father Lord, who is like you, Lord. Jesus. There is no one who is like you, Lord. There is no one. Say who is like you, Lord? There is no one. the beginning of time you are God after the earth has finished existing you continue to be God time does not limit you time cannot contain you you are the great that I am the almighty God you Lord are the lily of the valley you are the bright and morning sun there is no one like you Jesus from everlasting to everlasting generations to generations ages you Lord we bless we bless we bless we bless we bless your majesty king of all kings The trail of his robe fills this temple. I see the regalia of the Lord. He dances because we dance. He's honored because we worship in our hearts and from our hearts. Oh Jesus. Son of the true and living God. We give you praise. I just want to praise and praise and praise and worship. And I hear songs in my spirit. We just bless you.
Let your name alone be lifted. Have your way. We are your people. Speak your truth. And let the power of your word pierce through our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits. We are seated at your table, Holy Spirit. The buffet is spread. Feed us for your glory. We love you. We are ready for you. We honor you. In Jesus' mighty name. Come and shout a powerful hallelujah. Will you shout hallelujah? Oh God is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Please be seated. We serve an amazing God. A God that is beautiful beyond all description. The great that I am, the one who was and is and would be forever. We're still talking about relationships. This morning we're focused on relationship distractors. Say to your neighbor, relationship distractors. Relationship distractors. And right underneath that theme, I want to focus specifically this morning on resolving conflicts and resolve, restoring broken relationships. Resolving conflicts and restoring broken relationships. The truth is that as we relate one with another, it's inevitable that conflicts would not come. Conflict will come. Offenses will come. But God has also made provision for how we can recover from offenses. And now we can recover from conflicts. It's not God's design or God's intention that we remain and we dwell and stay in the place of conflicts. What God will like is that we will resolve it. That we will learn to be able to resolve conflicts and restore those relationships that have become broken, that have become broken. When you think of real things that can distract relationships, it all just boils into offense. I offended you, you offended me, I said things you didn't want me to say, I did things you didn't want me to do, I betrayed your trust, you betrayed my trust. Whatever, how, however way you dissect it, it all still goes back to offense and it all still goes back to conflicts. So we want to talk this morning about how we can resolve conflicts effectively 
and how we can restore relationships that have been broken because of one reason or the other. I will take my text on the book of Luke chapter 17 from verses 1 through 2, 5. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to what? To come. But what to anyone through whom they come? It will be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a milestone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in, in seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Not you, sh you consider forgiving them. He said, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Isn't that an amazing response? Jesus went through all of this and they're like, whoa, that's really difficult. How can, How can someone, someone keep, keep offending? offending me and you're asking me to keep forgiving them? He said, you know what, Lord? We acknowledge that we can't do this by our own strength. We ask you to please increase our faith. And the grace of God is available in this house today for everyone that will tap into it to receive the power and those, the, the ability to be able to resolve conflicts effectively and to be able to restore broken relationships. Jesus said it's inevitable for offenses to come. But then he said, woe to him through whom it comes. Do you know for a good while when I read that Bible verse, I always thought, oh wow, the people that give offense or whenever I give offense, I'm automatically on the guilty side because the Bible says, woe to him through whom it comes. But the other day it became very clear that this is not all that this text is saying. When the Bible says, woe to him to which offense comes, God is not talking about the fact that the person becomes condemned, but he's talking about the fact that offenses don't feel easy. They don't bring pleasurable emotions. Offenses don't feel good, whether to the offender or the offendee. If I get out of my way and I offend you and I do something you don't like and our relationship becomes strained, even I carry a level of guilt and I carry some type of burden. As the same way you carry the burden of the hurt, as the offendee, I also, or the offender, sorry, I also carry a burden. A burden of guilt, a burden of, oh God, I can't believe I did that. Why did I make such a mistake? Why did I do such thing? So whether I'm on the receiving side or on the side of giving, it's still not pleasurable. And that's why God is so interested. That's why he said, you know what? Then it really doesn't matter what they do. Please do all you can to forgive. Because strained relationships don't feel comfortable. They're not comfortable. Strained relationships brings fear. It brings anxiety. It brings discomfort. It brings a lack of joy. No rational human being enjoys when their relationship with somebody else becomes strained. Keyword, rational human. You have the outliers. But most people don't feel comfortable when their relationships are strained. It brings discomfort. And God's intention is not for us to live at discomfort or be at odds with each other. And that's why sometimes when we find that we have offended or we have created offense, one of the safest go-to that we do is we just disappear. We create a gap between ourselves and that person. We create a physical distance because every time I see you, I feel uncomfortable. Every time I see you, I, I, I'm reminded. Every time I see you, I carry a level of guilt. So it becomes easier for me to just withdraw myself. But that's not God's intention. That's not what God designed. Mark chapter 5, verse 9. I'm going to be reading to us a few Bible verses today, so please follow me because I just want us to see in God's word where God is coming from. Mark chapter 5, verse 9. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? Am I in the right place? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have the wrong Bible verse. All right. I'm going to skip it. One of the true marks of a true Christian is being a peacemaker. Being a peacemaker, being a peacemaker. When you're a peacemaker, it doesn't mean that you're avoiding conflict. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you're appeasing other people. 
That's not what it means. Being a peacemaker is that you are making sure that you're resolving conflicts effectively and that you're able to maintain and manage healthy relationships. Avoidance, not speaking up when it's needed, is not what makes you a peacemaker. Because sometimes they say, ah, I'm a peaceful person, so for that reason, I don't like to speak up. Even if something is not going my way, I'll just take it that way. That's avoiding. That's not being a peacemaker. That's losing yourself in the process. You should be able to, in a healthy relationship, you should be able to speak your truth without the fear of condemnation, without the fear of creating offense. We should be able to dialogue things out even when the conversation is difficult. So avoidance is not being a peacemaker. Appeasing is not being a peacemaker. I will let you walk all over me just so you can be okay. Just so that I won't rock the boat. That's abuse. It's not being a peacemaker. So if we find ourselves and we think, okay, well, because I want to be a peacemaker, I'm just going to avoid and not speak up when I should. I'm just going to let the other person get away with whatever, even though it breaks my heart. Please understand that that's not what God is talking about. I just want us to be clear. Because sometimes we take the scripture or we even hold the scripture over the heads of other people and expect them to take certain things just because we know that they are Christians, just because we know that they are God's children. Or sometimes we think we should be able to take anything just because we are Christians. That's not what we're talking about today. God's desire is that we truly resolve conflicts and restore those relationships that have been broken. That does not mean you need to get back with your ex. But it means you must be able to bury the ache. So there's a difference. It was a, an unhealthy relationship. I got out of it for a reason. Some things went south, some things went left. What we're saying, restoring broken relationships, we're not saying go back into a relationship that you know it's not good for you. What we're saying is get to a place where you can forgive them for all the pain they've caused you and you can be civil toward each other. Come to a place where we can bury the hatchet and everybody can move on with an open and a free mind. We may not be together anymore, but we don't have to be at war. We may not be together anymore, but we don't have to be enemies. I may not be your best friend anymore, but I, don't, but I don't have to find opportunities to want to make it clear that we are no longer best friends. We can still be cool. Does that make sense this morning? So resolving conflicts or restoring relationships does not mean that you go back to something that wasn't working for you. It means that you get to a place where you can truly be at peace with that person and forgive them for everything that, had, that has happened. An unresolved conflict is dangerous to you and it leads to the following. Number one, it blocks your fellowship with God. When you're walking around and you're carrying around unresolved conflicts, how can you relate peacefully with the Lord? How can you relate freely with the Lord Jesus? How can your life truly be what God has called it to be? So, oh, I'm the, I love God. I'm, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. But you're fighting almost everybody around you. You have so many people you're not talking to. And God is like, how can you claim that you love me and you can't be at peace with other people? If you're not at peace with others, you cannot claim to love the Lord. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or a sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. The Bible says that if I cannot be at peace, if I cannot love humans that I am able to see, then I dare not say I love God. It says I am a liar. So conflicts actually breaks your fellowship with God. It makes it difficult for you to be able to relate freely and, and you know, relate from a place of, of, of free freedom with the Lord. Because God himself is saying, I don't even believe you when you tell me you love me because you don't love the next person. So how can you love me? So it's important that we cultivate the grace. We receive the grace and cultivate the habit of resolving conflicts and restoring relationships because conflicts will always come. The only way you can avoid conflicts is to decide to live in a bubble. As long as you're roaming amongst men, you will always be offended by one thing or the other. It's normal. Even Jesus says it's normal because we're not perfect people. But we must learn to resolve conflicts. Number two, unresolved conflicts blocks your prayers and stops them from being answered. It blocks your prayers. It stops them from being answered. 
So if I have people I'm grudging against, people have made a decision I would never speak to again in my life, please guess what? Every prayer you're praying, you're just wasting your time because unresolved conflicts will cause your prayers not to be answered. I did not say it. God said it. Luke eleven four, Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Forgive me because I forgive. Forgive me as I forgive. So if I'm not able to forgive and let go, I shouldn't expect God to forgive me and let go. And the Bible says that sin causes a separation between God and I. It's not because God's ears are deaf or his hands are too short. He said, but your sins have separated you, and that's why you're not receiving answers. So if God is unable to forgive my sins because I won't forgive someone else, then my answers are somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Just waiting for me to come to the realization that I need to do something on my end to forgive other people so that my prayers can truly be answered. God even told the husband that don't let your prayer be hindered. Be at peace with your wife. Say because if you pray, if you are not at peace with your wife, your prayers will not will be hindered. And vice versa, woman, if you are not at peace with your husband, your prayers cannot be answered either. It's just amazing how we become so spiritual, and in fact, not even spiritual, religious. The word is not even spiritual. We become so religious that we think we can ignore the scripture. And as long as we can fast and pray and shout and roll, we we'll force God to hear us. None of us can force God to do anything. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He's so principled. He said his word will not be broken for any reason. The principles of God are very clearly laid out. He left nothing to ambiguity. He said, if you want me to hear you, then I need you to learn how to relate well with others. Unresolved conflict blocks your happiness. It blocks your happiness. No matter how famous you are, if the relationships in, in your life, if they are not healthy, there's no true peace. There's no true joy. Let's be real. Imagine going on a vacation and you paid all that money to take this very luxurious trip and you get there, and the person you went on vacation with, you guys started to fight. It doesn't matter how nice the scenery looks. You won't have any fun. A few years ago, Pastor and I went to um, San Antonio for the first time. And one thing led to the other. And we were fighting all through that trip. It was a horrible, horrible experience. Till today, I don't like San Antonio. I actually went back a few years later for a conference. And I was like, why are they having this conference in San Antonio of all places? I'm like, there's nothing here. There's nothing fun here. There's nothing to do here. Meanwhile, other people go to San Antonio and they have a blast. They have pictures everywhere because it's a historical city. I couldn't enjoy anything because emotionally I was not okay. It steals your peace. It steals your enjoyment. Broken relationships, unresolved conflicts steals your peace. It steals your peace. A person could have all the money. You could have all the wealth. You could have everything, but money can't talk back to you. Houses can't talk back to you. Cars cannot give you a hug. They can't. They can't hold your hand. So we need people. We need relationships. We need healthy relationships. I'm just here minding my business. And these days they say things like I'm sipping my tea and all this stuff. Like all those things are cute. But let's be honest. If the relationships in your life are not healthy and balanced, you cannot be all right. Every time I see you, I get an emotional reaction that is unpleasant. When I hear your voice, I get an emotional reaction that is unpleasant. If I run into your page on social media, I'm just so visceral and so angry. Why? Because the relationship has been broken. So this morning, I want to give us seven steps to resolving conflicts. And I hope you will take notes. And as we go through, I hope you start to think through relationships in your life that you could actually work toward restoring back to a healthy place. Number one, make the first move. Teach your neighbor, make the first move. 
Don't wait for the next person. We're always waiting for the next person to make the first move. Well, I didn't do nothing wrong, so she should say something first. Make the first move. It doesn't matter who was wrong. Make the first move. A peacemaker takes the first step. Making peace is so important to God that God said to them in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 23 to 24. He said, when you bring your offering to me and you remember that you have hurt against somebody, he said, leave your offering at the altar. Go back and make peace. And then you can come back and fully give your offering the way it's intended. Even though you left the offering at the altar, it's still not given because the giving happens where? In your heart. So the, the offering is laying at the altar. God did not say take it back. He said lay it at the altar. And then when you finish making peace, come back. And then you can truly give because at that point, your heart is in a place where I can truly receive that which you are offering to me and before me. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Come and offer your gift your gift. Because to God, reconciliation takes priority. Don't delay to do it. Don't make excuses. He just wants you to reconcile. It doesn't matter who was wrong, like I said. It doesn't matter who was right. God just wants you to make peace. Make peace and reconcile regardless of who created the offense. Conflict is never resolved accidentally. You must always be intentional about resolving it. It's not resolved accidentally. I won't attend to it. I won't do anything. Oh, you know, time heals all wounds. That's a lie. If someone has cancer and they don't seek medical care and they wait for time to heal the cancer, will it go away? Someone has a wound. They don't take the time to seek care and look for how to take care of it. Time heals all wounds. That's just a cliche that is not accurate. You have to be intentional about it. You have to want to make amends. With time, we'll be fine. No, no. God wants you to make a move. Because you know what? If I keep you at arm's length and I don't see you on a regular, I don't relate with you on a regular, I could be living under the falsehood of thinking I have forgiven you. When all that's happening is because I'm not seeing you, there's really nothing to think about. Out of sight, out of mind. Make the first move. Conflicts are not resolved accidentally. They must, you must, I must be intentional. I must be intentional. The only way to resolve a conflict is to face it. You just have to face it and go through it. It may feel uncomfortable. You may think, well, I have to start going through everything again and start talking about stuff that I'm trying to forget. What's the benefit of all of that? That's the only way out. You have to face it. Face it. Fear tries to stop you from resolving your conflicts. Because we are afraid of being vulnerable. But that would not solve anything. So make the first move. Number two, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. No wonder in our text, the disciples said, oh God, Give us the grace. This that you're asking us to do, to forgive people over and over again, we can't do by ourselves. Please give us the grace. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. You're going to need wisdom. He will give you what you need. He will ask him, Lord, help me so the love can fill my heart. Ask, me, give, ask him to give you what to say. Ask him to give you the courage to say what you need to say. Ask him to help you find the right time. Ask God for wisdom. I don't even know where do I start from. What would I say? How do I begin to resolve this? Ask God for wisdom. God wants you to resolve the situation. He will give you exactly what you ought to say. He will help you find the right time to address the issue because every time is not the right time. James 1.5 If any of you lacks wisdom, 
you should ask God. It's a very elastic. It stretches as far as you would allow it stretch to. Lord, just stretch my heart and fill me with love. Help me love people so much and love you so much that it becomes so easy for me to move on when things happen. I don't want to be stuck in pain. I don't want to be stuck nurturing what went wrong. I want to be able to move and move freely. So stretch my heart, Lord. Give me your heart. Help me to love the way you love. Help me to see people through your eyes. Because when I offend God, what God sees is not that horrible, horrible child. What he sees is I love her anyway. She made a mistake, but I still want her. I want to see people in the same way. So ask God for the wisdom. Number three, be fingers. The truth is you could 9% right. But maybe that 0.1% you could have done a little differently. Maybe you could have responded to the person's actions more differently than you did. Maybe you were a bit too aggressive in your response. Maybe you waited too long to help them see that they were doing this. So they didn't know that it was hurting you this much and they kept doing it anyway. Maybe there are other things you could have done better. Own your part first. People are more amenable to hear you when you start out with this issue that happened. I take responsibility for blah, 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 and blah. It puts the other person at ease to be able to have a conversation with you that is coming from a place, coming from a place of love. Don't be defensive. Don't point fingers. Do not blame. Just come from a place of this is maybe what I could have done better. Do you know that the real source of any conflict is not is, is actually what is going on inside of you? That's it. The real source of any conflict is what's going on on the inside of you, on the inside of me. If I am at peace on the inside and I am full of love on the inside, very little things will be eliciting a reaction from me. I won't be offended by everything. Everything won't be getting on my nerves because I have matured on the inside and I'm walking in God's love. That when things happen, it's okay. It's not that I will agree with everything that happens around me. I don't have to react to everything that happens around me. Everything around me does not have to elicit an unpleasant reaction on the inside of me. I may not approve of it. I may not agree, but I can still disagree in love. I can still disagree from a place of, you know what, it's okay. Into maturing we on the inside. Everything irks you, everything irritates you, everything gets you to fly off the handle, then it means there's still work that needs to happen on the inside of you. If you are at peace and absolutely in love with God and others, things won't bother you as much or they won't even bother you at all. Other people will look at you and say, but why aren't you bothered by that? How, how can you just let that go? It's like, it's okay. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? They don't come from the desires that battle. They, they do come. Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? I'll read that again. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from desires that battle within you? They, it comes from within. What causes conflicts on the outside is not the real, it's not the actual thing that was done. It's me on the inside. Because the truth is, two people can experience the same exact situation and have two complete reactions to it. One person is bent out of shape, falling over, vomiting because they're so upset. And the other person is like, is she okay? What happened to her? It's like, weren't you here? Didn't you see what just happened? Like, what happened? I didn't even notice it. What's wrong? Who we are on the inside. Who we are on the inside. So begin by looking inward. Introspect. Yes, I sit down to, to resolve. I start with, I own what I'm supposed to own first. But then on a regular, I can train up myself in God's love that everything does not cause me distress. I can disagree without being distressed over it. I can disagree without being distressed over it. Number four, listen for the other person's hurt and perspective. 
again, you could be 99.9% right. But the other person's hurt is also valid. Listen for it. Try to understand it and respond appropriately to it. Sometimes as humans, just by the nature of how we are wired, we justify our own fears. We justify our own emotions. We rationalize our own reactions. But we can't understand the pain and the fears and the anxiety of other people. Oh, get over it. It's not a big deal. What's your problem? If I'm going to truly resolve conflicts, then I have to be able to validate the way that person is feeling. I have to listen for their perspective. I have to listen for their hurt. Because again, it's in addressing the emotion. That's where we can resolve and restore. If the emotion of pain, the emotion of disappointment, the emotion of whatever it is, if it's not properly addressed, we can't address the issue. So the problem is not so much that I move the cup from here to here. Why are you upset? All I did was move the cup. No, that's not why I'm upset. I'm upset because I have asked you severally to stop moving the cup. Those are two different things. What's the big deal? No, no, no. The big deal is that you don't really listen to me. You don't hear me when I'm trying to communicate with you. It's not the action. It's the emotion behind it. Take the time to understand the source of the emotion. What's making you feel this way? Why is this such a big deal? Because in my mind, it's not a big deal. But for whatever reason, it's upsetting you so much. I want to understand why. But many a time we were so glued on the actual act that was, we missed the entire thing that we were trying to communicate. It's not a big deal. For you it's not. But for me it is. And it bothers me because we've been through it over and over and over again. Listen for the hurt. Listen for the emotions behind the words that are being spoken. The emotion is what carries the meaning of the word. Because right now I can say to you, sit down. And at 12 p.m. I can say to you, sit down. And in those two instances, I mean something completely different. But I'm using the exact same words. Because it's the emotion that matters. If you come to me now and I say, oh, sit down, please. Just nothing. I offered you a seat. Sit down, please. All right. And then you sit down. We're fine. And then at 12 p.m., you and I are having an argument, and I say, sit down, please. It doesn't mean the same. The first one, I was offering you a seat. The second one, I'm saying to you, calm down. It doesn't mean the same thing. So it's not the words. It's the emotion behind it. So if you're truly going to resolve conflicts, you must take the time and become intentional about understanding the other person's hurt, their pain, the emotion behind the words. Number five, I love this one. Speak the truth tactfully. Yes, the Bible says the truth sets you free, but you must learn how to communicate the truth in love. Speak the truth tactfully. Don't come to me and tell me, oh, you know you're fat. You need to lose weight. In your mind, you're trying to help me, but you may have just shut that person down, so down emotionally that you just tarnish their self-image that actually the strength to get up and do anything about the weight is gone. As compared to, there are other ways I could do it. Maybe I could bring you healthier meals. Maybe I could say, you know what? There's this, um, this um, thing we go to that's really fun where we exercise, you will enjoy it. Let's go, let's do it together. And then as a person begins to do those things and they start to feel better about them, themselves, they get more committed. So you can be speaking the truth. You can use the right words. But if you're not saying it the right way, you lose the message. Speak the truth tactfully. Don't just say things because, you know, somebody say, ah, the way I am, I just say what's on my mind. You're a foolish and wicked person. Yeah. You can't just say it the way it is on your mind. You must consider the next person. Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, 
we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. The Bible says when you speak the truth in love, you become more like Jesus. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. If you yell, people don't hear you anymore. All they see is you're being an emotional person and the message is lost. Never use the truth as a crutch. Never use the truth as a crutch. I just, I just speak my mind. That's, it's reckless. It's mean. It's inconsiderate. Choose today to stop using harmful words when you're speaking to others. You're speaking to your spouse. You're speaking to your children, your friends, your family members. Anyone you're speaking to, learn to fight fair. Choose your words. Don't label people. You're lazy. You're this. You're that. If you already labeled me as lazy, why are we having this conversation? What's the point? What's the point? Fight fair. Choose your words. You're stupid. How do you call someone stupid and then you still want to have an healthy conversation after that? How? What's there to talk about? It's like we're done. You don't know how to do anything right. Wow, like nothing, right? Are you kidding me? Like zero, really? As compared to giving feedback from a place of love and feedback that would cause people to want to grow and to be better. Number six, fix the problem, not a blame. Fix the problem, not a blame. We're always looking for who to blame. Somebody needs to take responsibility. Learn to attack the issue and not the other person. Stop trying to figure out who to blame for the situation. Instead, devote your energy into fixing the actual problem. Fix the problem. Stop looking for who to blame, who to hold responsible. You know, if you hadn't done, if you hadn't said, it, da, 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 forget all of that. Let's just address the issue at hand. Lastly, focus on reconciliation not resolution. Focus on res re reconciliation, not resolution. Reconciliation means establishing, re-establishing the relationship. We don't need to go back to the way we used to be, but we can bury the hatchet and move on. On the other hand, resolution means we want to settle every aspect of the conflict and be able to see eye to eye. We may love each other really, really, like, deeply, but we would not always see everything eye to eye. And we should be okay with that. It's okay to disagree. It's okay not to agree, you know. I don't agree, but if that's what you're asking, then it, it, that's it. I'm not upset. Right? We can still move on. So focus on reconciling the relationship and not you want to force me to see your point of view. And if I can't see your point of view, this relationship cannot move forward. There's something wrong. You still don't agree with me. I don't have to agree, but I can be respectful. I don't have to agree, but I can still love you in spite of. Unity does not equal to uniformity. We can live in unity. It doesn't mean we have to be the same and think the same and react the same and show up the same way all the time. We can definitely get along without agreeing on everything or on every point. Your ministry as God's child is the ministry of reconciliation and restoring of relationships relationship with God and others truly do matter. God doesn't hold our imperfections or mistakes against us and he expects us not to maliciously hold other people's mistakes against them either. Choose today to be an agent in the world, an agent of peace in a world that is full of conflict. Make up your mind that you will live at peace with other people it's not because the people are perfect. It's not because they know how to behave. It's not because they always know how to show up. But you just decide that, you know what? I love God too much to be at odds with other people. I don't want my prayers to be hindered. I don't want my fellowship to God to be disrupted. I choose Jesus. He's way more important. Can you rise up on your feet with me this morning? And I want us to think in our hearts 
Because sometimes we come to church and we hear the message and in the moment we are charged up. But the moment we step outside, it's almost like the parable of the seed of the sower. Something comes and snatches it up. So I want us to think through right now and make up our minds. Who are you still at conf in conflict with? Who haven't, you, who haven't you reconciled with? Again, you don't have to go back to your ex in other to be at peace with your ex. God has given us an opportunity this morning to look through our lives and identify relationships that have been broken that maybe should not have been broken. Can you think through what you could have done? How you could have helped the relationship to have weathered the storm that it went through? Can you think in your heart and ask God for wisdom? Ask him for courage to be able to make the first move. Wisdom to be able to say the right things, to find the right time. The heart so full of love that the thought of even being malicious towards anybody causes you to cringe. Speak to the Lord. Come on, take the time this morning to speak to the Lord. And please make a decision to reconcile. Speak the names of the people before the presence of the Lord this morning. These are the people that I'm still upset with. But I release it. I let it go. I choose reconciliation. I choose to resolve the conflicts. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Because of where you are headed, because of what it is that you still need to receive, there is no room, no room, no room for malice, no room for unresolved conflicts. It's time to let it go and move on. I'm waiting on you, Lord, to bless me. God says, no, I'm waiting on you, child. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to make the right decisions, to make the right moves, to reconcile, to let go and to forgive. Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor and we exalt you in the name of Jesus. Today we receive strength, we receive grace, we receive power to be able to forgive and to let go, Lord Jesus. To reconcile relationships that seem to have been broken and seem to have been strained. And we ask, Lord, for strength and for grace to be able to do so. And that your name alone will be glorified. Thank you for who you are, Father. Breed upon we, your people, and let your name be praised forever. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you, Jesus. At this time, we're going to take our tithes, our offerings, our seeds, our vows, our pledges. This is the third Sunday of the month. So it's our Beyond Bricks Sunday. Our Beyond Bricks is the project towards paying off our church mortgage. And some of us committed to paying certain amounts every third Sunday of the month. This is the time to please redeem it. If you weren't a part of it previously, you want to be a part of it, it's very okay. It's an agreement between you and the Lord. So please just join us. Just join us. I think we'll take our Beyond Bricks first, and then we'll do our tithes and our offerings after the fact and our vows. So if you are part of Beyond Bricks and you'd like to redeem your Beyond Bricks today, this is the third Sunday of the month, please rise up on your feet with me so we can just agree together. It's Beyond Bricks. It's the third Sunday we want to redeem our commitment to the Lord. You can give using one of our plat any or one of our platforms. Or you weren't a part of it previously, but now you want to become a part. Please join us as we rise together. Father, we bless you and we honor you. Daddy, Lord, David looked and said, wait, the ark of covenant of God lives in a tent and I live in my own house. He said, no, it ought not to be so. 
I will build a house for the Lord so that God's ark can dwell in the place. Father Lord, you put in our hearts, in the hearts of your people, all of us, to build you this sanctuary. We thank you, Lord, even as we have come together, oh God, even like David did, even like Solomon did, oh God, to build your house, to be a partaker of paying of the mortgage of this property. Father, even as you blessed David and you blessed Solomon beyond measure, I ask, oh God, that you bless each and every one in the name of Jesus. Father, for as many, oh God, that are partaking, oh God, in this project, you will do the unusual in each and every life. You will bless in so much abundance and that will, there will not be enough room to contain it. And your name alone will be glorified in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. The baskets are going around if you're dropping traditionally with an envelope. Please lift up your tithes, your offerings, your seeds, your vows. If you're giving your Beyond Bricks in one envelope like I'm doing, that's fine as well. Just go ahead and lift up your tithes, your seeds, your offerings, your vows and say, Lord, I honor you. This belongs to you. I give it to you for your glory. Father, take it. Let your name alone be lifted. We love you. We honor you. As we bring all of the tithes into your storehouse, we ask, oh God, that you will open the windows of heaven and you'll pour out to us a blessing and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. So we give our tithes in God's house to keep the house of God running, right? To pay the church mortgage, to pay the utility bills, to keep God's house running running and we pray that as you've partaken the Lord will bless you and he will honor you and he will keep you in the name of Jesus. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, I just want to us to appreciate our mama in the house. Thank you so much for such a wonderful message. Um, like she said, it's not just for you to just hear it. Think about that message. It actually ministered to me. And I hope that God will give us the wisdom to act and add it to our own lives because that's the only way we can change. That's what knowing God is all about. Hearing the word and being a doer of the word. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. I just have a few more announcements. I want us to celebrate our teenagers. They are serving in the house. You see them all over the place. Celebrate them. Celebrate them, the young ones. Um, today is Sunday. They are serving. They are helping us and God will bless you as you grow into young adults in Jesus' name. Um, I want to welcome those that are just coming to the service for the first time. If today is your first time of coming here, we want to celebrate you. We want to welcome you. Please just, um, oh, hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming to the House of Stars, a place for refuge. Please welcome them. Give them the Holy Ghost welcome. We love you. We celebrate you. Thank you for coming to worship with us. We know that God will bless you and keep you rich in the name of Jesus. Um, after the service, please, you will go to my right, to my left, and uh, one of our pastors will meet with you just to give you a warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I also want to let us know that, um, reiterate what um, we announced this morning about the team talk team talk with the Lord. It's a beautiful pro program that we put in place. This team talk is teaching our teenagers how to know God, teaching them God himself. So it's very important that as a parent, that's the main reason for coming to know God. You, you want your children to know God. You want your children to not just come here and just while away the time. You want them to have a relationship. That's what they are talking about relationship with God. The reason why our mama was telling us about relationship is because you already know God. So when you know God, it will be easier for you to relate with your fellow man. Praise the Lord. Uh, so please bring your um, 
help drop them off. We're starting that in October 1st. And also we have the game nights. Our, our youth, our children, they really love that game night. We did it last year. Game night is September 23rd. And also, um, we're coming to the time where we need to, you know, heat up ourselves for this cold. So we are having a coat drive. And I want to encourage us. There must be something this year that you've done for somebody else. <clears throat> so this is the opportunity. You either go out there and get us in beautiful coat. They are not too expensive. Just buy them and want to give it out to people who are homeless, people who need to be kept warm and cannot afford it. And if you have money to donate, please, if you want to put it in the donation bag, just put for coat drive so that we will know that that's what the money is for. And as you do that, God will bless you richly in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to the medical team. You know, because of a lot of things going on now, uh, a lot of people are going through some issues that we don't want to discuss. So we're bringing a team in to talk to us about our mental health. Let's not deceive ourselves. A lot of us have issues that we need to be resolved. God is helping us, but sometimes you need to talk about it. You need to ask questions. You don't know who to ask. You want to understand. Maybe it's happening to your friend, maybe happening to a member of the family, even you yourself. But this is the opportunity. Next week, we're having a mental health talk. Talk, questioning, and your problems. As you bring them here, maybe we'll have answers to your questions. And with God helping us, every one of us will remain healthy in Jesus' name. Um, can we just rise up? so that we can do the um, HCC expression. I want, you to I want you to celebrate yourself. Celebrate yourself. I mean, look at yourself and say, Father, I just thank you for my life. Celebrate yourself. Clap for yourself. Sometimes it's good to be happy with yourself. Hallelujah. Celebrate yourself. Oh, I celebrate myself. Thank you, Jesus. For making me me. For making me unique. Hallelujah. Amen. Shall we go ahead with the HCC expression? HCC is a church striving for perfection. We will do our part to promote a culture of God's love because we are visionaries who are audacious, yet loving, understanding, and approachable. We are balanced individuals who lead our world with Elsa. Listen, we want to go through that again. I want you to think through it because you are stepping out of here to start a new week. You want to encourage yourself with those words. Shall we do it again? HCC is a church striving for perfection. We do our part to promote a culture of God's love because we I, I am a visionary. I am audacious, yet loving, understanding, and approachable. I am a balanced individual, and I will lead my world with else. Say that last one again. I, Kate Okusonya, will lead my world with excellence. May the Lord help you to live an excellent life. May the Lord help you to stand before the throne of grace to receive that blessing that you will give out to others. May the Lord help you to thrive in this world that we live in. May the Lord help you to be established in the name of Jesus. Every of your heart desire as you move out of this place today, the Lord will meet it for you at the point of your need. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord let His face to shine upon you. May the Lord leave the light of his countenance upon you. May the Lord grant you peace now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.